Okay, to get things started, um, probably there's a lot more going on on that title of this lecture than, I, than maybe you realize. Um, the first part of it, Valakovsky was right. Whoops, one more. How to con conjugate Jupiter as a verb. Terrible. Anyway, um, Manuel Velikovsky was a Israeli psychiatrist who dabbled a little bit in cosmology. He was one of the founders of Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he actually worked with Albert Einstein to uh, for the creation of the state of Israel. I mean, he was an A number one scholar, mainly in psychiatry and psychology. Uh, like, but like I say, he also dabbled a little bit in uh, astronomy and that type of thing. And um, Velikovsky published a book called Worlds in Collision. His theories about how the world evolved and stuff was so bad that Macmillan, who was the publisher of his book, was actually boycotted by a whole group of scientists who basically said they wouldn't buy their textbooks ever again because they published Velikovsky's book. Now that's that's definitely uh, way out there as far as uh, uh, you know how how bad a, a, a theories uh, he was putting together. So Macmillan uh, really wanted to keep on publishing the book because it was a bestseller. So they gave the book to one of their little smaller companies. It was called Doubleday. And now Doubleday is publishing their books. And Velikovsky has had a little bit of a uh, resurgence in recent times. What Velikovsky did, um, Emmanuel Vel, I should say Dr. Emmanuel Velikovsky, he looked at the various things that happened to the earth, like Noah's flood, uh, Joshua ordering the sun not to move, or even the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he looked at the myths around the world. So he was actually using comparative mythology to come up with a reason for these things to happen. Uh, he looked at myths, uh, even like Venus being born full, full grown from the head of Zeus or Jupiter. And at that point, something snapped. And so Velikovsky set up his uh, search for how our solar system evolved. So um, there's uh, Venus being born full grown out of the head of Jupiter. So he set up that he said that the planet Earth had suffered many natural catastrophes on a global scale, both before and during mankind's recorded history. And there's evidence for these catastrophes in the geological record. And these, these catastrophes, since they occurred all over the world, you can find them in, in the written histories or the myths of ancient cultures and civilizations. And the causes of these natural catastrophes were close encounters between the Earth and other bodies within the solar system. And that's where everything basically stopped. To explain how these things happened, how the planets did not follow the laws of physics. Velikovsky invented a role 
for electromagnetic forces in counteracting gravity and the orbital mechanics. This did not sit well with most astronomers. What Velikovsky uh, basically pushed was, or he, called it, he called his religion uh, catastrophism. So what Velikovsky was pushing was the fact that you have the planets that are uh, the inner planets, and as you can see, Venus was missing, and Venus actually was born from Jupiter and ended up where Venus is today. In the process of doing that, it pulled Mars around, actually caused the Earth to stand still for Joshua's laws, for Joshua's battles, and also caused the Great Flood. I mean, it did a lot of different things. And um, we have to remember that, once again, Velikovsky was actually a psychiatrist. And he claimed that most of these things that happened were part of a collective amnesia that overcame the minds of these people living in ancient times. The other thing you have to remember was that Velikovsky was wrong. He was wrong about Venus being born full grown out of the head of Jupiter. Why everyone, everyone knows it was Athena that was born full grown out of the head of Jupiter. And those same people that know that know for certain that it was Venus or Aphrodite that was actually born out of sea foam. I mean, really, you've got to get these things straight. Velikovsky, <laughs> Velikovsky did uh, subscribe to how the planets were formed, the fact that they were uh, came out of the, uh, the uh, turning cloud of dust and dirt, and they were formed out of this uh, mess of, uh, of dust and rock. And uh, scientists more recently have come up with uh, uh, possibly a better explanation for this. They believe that there's actually two lines that are important within our solar system as it was forming. They call it the soot line and the frost line. Between the soot line and the frost line, uh, there is a, a place where PAHs are formed. Now, what the heck is, is a PAH? Why everyone knows that happens to be polycyclic amoric hydrocarbons. Uh, Let's put it this way. It's a place where we have organic molecules. It's just that simple. So outside the frost lines, they really can't form because water is frozen. And inside the soot line, they can't form because at that point, water is a gas. So Right now, the scientists are calling that the habitable zone, and that's where water is a liquid and where life could possibly form. So looking at our solar system after all the uh, dust and dirt and particles formed into the planets, we have our solar system, Mercury through Pluto. Now, I apologize for having Pluto, but having been schooled in the 1960s and 70s, um, I believe Pluto is a planet and should remain that way. However, I realize that there has to be a way of memorizing this, so there are actually two songs that you could uh, sing. One of them is My Very Educated Mother, just served us nine pizza pies. But for those of you who were born in the 1980s 
and don't remember Pluto as being a planet, then you have my very <clears throat> educated mother just served us noodles. Either way is correct. Anyway, but looking at the main planet in this, one planet does actually stand out, and that happens to be the planet Jupiter. Jupiter is a fairly unusual planet. Um, through a telescope, it's really neat to see. Um, this is a little bit enhanced. Uh, for one thing, you can see that Jupiter is sporting a red spot there. Actually, through a telescope, when you're looking at it live, it doesn't really appear red. I have always called it the great beige spot, but you can see it through a medium-sized telescope fairly easily. Uh, through a smaller telescope, you can definitely see uh, Jupiter and at least four of its moons uh, you know, watching it going around given, given some time. So Jupiter is a, is a wonderful planet to look through a telescope. And uh, unfortunately, right now, uh, Jupiter is not easily seen. Uh, I believe it's an early morning star. And it's, uh, but it will show the moons going around it. If you were to take a closer look, one of them happens to come from the uh, probe Voyager 1, and you can see it here on the upper left. You can see that those bands of clouds are moving in different directions, going from top to bottom. Now, what, how they took this picture was they actually had a picture taken every time uh, Jupiter made one revolution. So what you're seeing is a combination of just a picture per Jupiter day. On the right side, you can see that Jupiter does rotate on its axis. It rotates once every about 9.8 Earth hours. As a result, if you were on the equator, you would be traveling at about 22,000 miles per hour. As a comparison to the, to the Earth, if you're on the equator, you would be traveling at about 1,000 miles per hour. On the lower left, you have a graph as how those bands are moving in relation to, to each other. And you can see that if you were walking across the surface, actually, Jupiter doesn't have much of a surface, but if, if you were walking from one band to the other, uh, you would be torn apart by at the place where the bands actually meet, because one of them could be going 400 miles in one direction, and the other one could be going 400 miles in the other direction. So you would definitely become a slice and dice. Not a very fun thing to be. Okay, now Jupiter also has four moons that we can see here on the Earth uh, using a small telescope. These moons were discovered by Galileo using his little telescope. Now, just like today, Galileo was always looking for someone to pay for his research. And he never called them Europa or Eo or any of those. He actually called them the Medician moons because the Medici family were very, very rich and he was looking to get a payout. So it's lucky today that they're not called the Medician moons because the Medicis are no longer in power uh, as Pope or in Rome. However, going from one, to a, one moon to another, there are some interesting things about each of them. Europa, the one on the extreme left, actually has more water on it than all the oceans combined on the Earth. 
So you want to take your galoshes with you if you go to Europa. Ganymede on the right is actually bigger than the planet Mercury. And finally, Eo, that's how you pronounce that, by the way. Uh, I don't think it's called Io, but Eo has many active volcanoes on it, spewing molten sulfur, not a pleasant thing. And its surface is constantly being needed by the gravitational pull of Jupiter. As a result, Eo is extremely hot, does not have a solid surface, and the gravitational pressures are are, are, are killing, are just uh, not a good place to be. Meanwhile, the only thing I can say about Callisto is the fact that it's a, a whole lot of ice on there. So if you're looking at what's going around Jupiter, you'll find that we have the four Galilean moons, and then beyond that we have a whole bunch of other moons uh, literally a cloud of moons all going in different directions. And uh, most of them are extremely hard to see. By the way, for, your, your, for the Drake fans, uh, Dr. Daniel Morehouse, who was the builder of the Drake Observatory, actually did his PhD on one of the moons of Jupiter. He actually figured out what the, uh, basically the uh, motion statistics were for that, specific, for that specific moon. The name of that moon was Ilana. Anyway, so the little piece of uh, information there. Jupiter, besides emitting all that light that we can see as the planet, is also emitting radio waves. And Jupiter is possibly one of the louder objects, radio objects in the sky. And this was, this was uh, actually in 1955. And it was discovered that Jupiter at that point is actually giving off more energy than it receives from the sun. So Jupiter is uh, definitely a very active planet. You can see from the radio, I guess, a uh, radio movie on the uh, upper right, that it does have a very, very active magnetic field. Uh, looking down, we have something that says HST, which is the Hubble Space Telescope. And then above that, we have a radio uh, gram called ALMA, which is actually the name of several radio telescopes. And you can see that uh, there is a strong band <coughs> of, uh, of energy going right across the surface of that planet. And you can take a look at the red spot and you can see that there's not a whole lot happening on that red spot. Uh, there's some radio emission, but not very much. Being a signature characteristic of that giant planet, a lot of attention has been given uh, to that red spot uh, over the past 200 years. And uh, one thing which they've noticed during the past, well, the past 40 years is the fact that that red spot is first of all a giant storm on that planet but over the past 40 years it's actually been getting smaller it's lost about half of its size during the past 40 years so in fact uh there are some bands on the planet itself uh, that are actually gaining energy and others that have lost it. So they don't know exactly what's going on on that planet. They do know that based upon its orbit and how it holds its moons 
in, in its orbit that Jupiter actually weighs twice all the other planets combined. So Jupiter is definitely a fairly fat planet, has a lot of mass to it. It's been suggested that if Jupiter were about twice the mass, it would have enough internal heat to become a star. I'm not quite sure about that, but I, but I do know that in more recent times, many astronomers have reclassified Jupiter as a brown dwarf star, which would actually hold more true. Brown dwarf stars are not undergoing nuclear reactions, uh, but they are actually emitting a great deal of energy. So uh, maybe that's what we should consider Jupiter to be, a brown dwarf star. Well, with all that mass, Jupiter well, a lot of would-be scientists have looked at Jupiter and say, it must be affecting the Earth. And in fact, there have been many books coming out on how Jupiter affects the Earth. One of the big ones that came out in the late 1970s was something called the Jupiter Effect. It basically prophesied that on March 10th, and by the way, the book was published about 1978. It said that on March 10th, 1982, there will be uh, a horrible, horrible earthquake in Los Angeles that would totally destroy the city. And this was brought on by the combination of all of the gravitational fields of the planets and they happen to be on the same side of the sun. So everyone was looking forward with some trepidation to March 10th, 1982. And guess what? It didn't happen. When that was brought up to the authors saying, uh, you blew it, 1982 you know, has come and gone, and they said, what do you mean? It happened. It actually happened two years before that because Mount St. Helens was, was blown up by the combination of the gravitational fields of all the planets. Now it happened a little early, but still you can't discount it because it definitely caused that problem. Well, here we have a perfect case of 2020 hindsight. I think they were definitely grasping at gravitational straws. In reality, the amount of energy, gravitational energy, that would be exerted by all the planets against the Earth uh, would be like, I don't know, uh, I think somebody somebody equated it to, I, I think it was a mosquito landing on your wrist. So uh, that was definitely uh, disproven. I mean, yeah, uh, Jupiter does have some effect, but it certainly wasn't enough to cause earthquakes and the other stuff happening on the Earth. Jupiter has been the subject of exploration really ever since uh, Jupiter was looked at by Galileo. Uh, a good number of probes have gone not only to Jupiter, but has, has used Jupiter as a gravitational kick to go to other planets. Um, one of the first probes that went to Jupiter was Pioneer 10. And Pioneer 10 was actually a test of a theory. And that was, let's go ahead, blast something off down here on the lower left, 
send it off to Jupiter, and let's see where it goes after it leaves. And it went off in a weird direction, and they said, you know what? We might be able to use that on Pioneer 11 so that we can use the same probe and get two planets for the price of one. So they sent, so with Pioneer 10, they went out there, they took images of Jupiter, Saturn, and then, uh, let's go back one, and as you can see with Pioneer 11, they actually, this is on the right, actually passed Jupiter. Jupiter changed the, uh, the pathway of Pioneer 11, so it actually crossed the solar system. It caught up with Saturn and took pictures of Saturn. So this was a definitely a new game of gravitational billiards. They used that with Voyager 1. They used the extreme gravity of Jupiter to change the direction of Voyager 1 so that it would cross the path of Saturn. And it took these wonderful pictures of the belt work on that. Meanwhile, on Voyager 2, they used, they actually used uh, Jupiter and Saturn to change the path of Voyager 2 so that it would catch up with Uranus and Neptune. You got four planets for the price of one. Voyager 1 and 2 at this point are actually beyond the, um, they're certainly not beyond the influence of the sun, but they are beyond the uh, uh, particle, the particle emission or the solar wind of our sun. They are still well within our solar system and will probably stay in our solar system for about another, I don't know, 30, 40,000 years, because our solar system extends a lot further than just the planets. So moving out, we have lots of neat pictures from Voyager 1 and 2. Uh, certainly, uh, we also have the first pictures of Uranus and Neptune. A volcano, an active volcano, was discovered on EO, spewing molten sulfur. And again, you have the bands on Jupiter moving in different directions. The next one out was Galileo spacecraft that not only used the uh, gravitational slingshot of Jupiter, but it also used the Earth. Uh, on its way out to Jupiter, it passed by the Earth several times in order to gain enough of a kick to be able to get out to Jupiter. And the reason for that was the fact that Galileo was way more massive than the Voyagers, plus the fact that Galileo had a probe that actually descended into the atmosphere of Jupiter. And what it found was rather surprising. It actually, the chute opened and at the point where the cover was removed and it started reading uh, the uh, atmosphere around Jupiter, it was about Oh, somewhere around a half of bar of atmosphere. That's about half the thickness of the atmosphere of the Earth. As it got further and further down, you can see that the number of bars increased tremendously. After an hour, at around 24 bars, that's about 24 times the thickness of our atmosphere, the signal 
was lost. The chances are the probe was probably crushed by the tremendous atmosphere of Jupiter. It never hit ground. There really isn't any ground on, on Jupiter. We found that the temperatures increased tremendously. Uh, you can see that the last data was beyond 20 bars. Like I said, it was 24. And the temperature was over 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, that's where the data was lost. The gases that were analyzed, as you can see, run the gamut from hydrogen to xenon. And you can see that water plays a significant role to, uh, to some of the uh, other elements on there. Hydrogen is the number one element, helium, methane, ammonia, and water. Remember last week, or yeah, last week we talked about the fact that water has been found everywhere. You can't go anywhere in our solar system without running into water. Juno was the last probe that was sent out to Jupiter. And it actually passed by fairly close to the surface of Jupiter. And it follows something called a highly elliptical orbit so that it can go very close and then go out and find all of the uh, uh, the magnetic fields that surround Jupiter. So here are its orbits, and it'll be going on uh, for about another another year or so. At which point, uh, Juno will be uh, told to get into the uh, Jovian atmosphere and burn up in the atmosphere. Meanwhile, the pictures coming back from Juno are absolutely amazing. Here is an infrared picture talking about looking at all of the different energies that are on that planet. And as you can see, the planet is a very active planet. There is an aurora, almost a constant aurora, on Jupiter. And again, this is formed by the magnetic field that's on the planet. On the left, you can see as the probe passes by relatively close to the planet, it takes some amazing pictures of the surface, and some of them are absolutely breathtaking. And these pictures are extremely high resolution so that we can take these pictures and blow them up to an amazing uh, amazing picture. I mean, you can almost looks like a, an art form, but those are actually, uh, as you can see, those are actually, uh, uh, I guess I say squigglies, where the two bands meet and they cause a lot of atmospheric disturbances where, uh, again, you have opposite winds going at three or 400 miles an hour. And uh, it really messes things up. It's kind of like Des Moines on a bad day. Anyway, um, the last probe that used Jupiter's kick in the pants was New Horizons. And New Horizons passed by Jupiter on its way out to uh, Pluto and out, uh, out to the Kuiper object. And what Jupiter's tremendous gravity did, it actually added 10,000 miles per hour to New Horizons so that it would get there in nine months, actually, actually nine, about nine years actually, rather than the 
normal 12 to 14 years. So the, the, the kick in the pants that New Horizons got, again, added enough so that if you were looking out a window <laughs> on New Horizons, you would find uh, something like this. Wouldn't it be fun to <clears throat> fly, let's say, to Japan or send something that would go 56,000 miles per hour? That means you would get to Japan in about five, ten minutes. Wow. That's a lot better than the 12 hours I spent on a plane before. Anyway, let's keep on going here. Uh, what's interesting about this is the fact that when the spacecraft picks up some of that energy from the planet, the planet actually loses a little bit of energy. This gravitational slingshot actually causes the spacecraft to move faster and the planet to move slower. There is a conservation of energy here. But what you have to remember is the, back, is the fact that the spacecraft has so little mass compared to the planet that the planet would slow infinitesimally and it would hardly slow down at all. But is it possible that we would be sending so many probes out there that eventually the planet would actually fall in to the solar system and get closer to the sun. Theoretically, it is possible. And it's already happening in a way to our moon only in the opposite direction. So uh, there was an interesting Star Trek a number of years ago that talked about the fact that warp drive warp space so many times that there was actually a rip in the space-time fabric. That's an interesting concept, but anyway, but I think Star Trek covers an awful lot of different, uh, different possible theories there. A paper uh, was uh, submitted for publication not too long ago. Uh, the effects of Jupiter on Earth's climate. There's something that you'll never read in any other journal. Environmental Earth Sciences. That is a real journal. And this was published in that. And then about three years later, it was picked up by USA Today which kind of made it legitimate. What it's talking about is the fact that Jupiter's and Venus's gravitational effect do affect the motion of our planet. So we're gonna give you a little bit of background on that and then we'll move forward. The background on that is the fact that as we move around the sun as we revolve about the sun we move according to kepler's first law and that is when we're further away we move slower when we move in toward perihelion we move faster that's actually well it's it's that's actually kepler's second law and you can equate it to when you're on one of those whips that you're at, at the um, uh, state fair, which unfortunately is not gonna happen, but when you're at the one end of it, you get whipped around in your seat and at the far end, you're going around slowly. So our earth is doing this. So when we are further away, we will have longer and cooler summers and when we're short, at the short end, we will have shorter and warmer winters because our orbit is an ellipse. And we are, when we're at perihelion, 
or at the short side, it happens to be winter now. But the Earth is also undergoing something called precession, where the Earth is actually wobbling in its orbit. As the Earth wobbles, it actually changes its axis of rotation so that it points to different stars. Right now, it happens to be pointing toward Polaris. So right now in, uh, in 13,000 years, it'll be pointing toward Vega. So right now, winter has us at perihelion, and we're pointing at Polaris. When we are pointing at Vega, now the north side will be pointing toward the sun. It'll be summer, so the, uh, our seasons will actually be six months out of phase. Where am I going with all this? We'll keep on moving here. So as a result of that, when we are at perihelion or at the close point, if you measure the number of days between September and March, the equinoxes, and you're going through December, going through winter, you see that there's 179 days. When you go from the March equinox through summer to the fall equinox, there's 186 days. So right now, we have, again, a shorter winter than we have a summer. Well, that's lucky, especially here in Iowa. So when we get to that point, who cares, right? Well, the sun is, being, is already being affected by its distance from us because in winter, we are actually five million kilometers closer, about two and a half million miles closer to the sun than we are in summer. That two and a half million miles changes our climate so that our winters are not as bad as they could be. Now, not only does that happen, but Jupiter and the sun, do, the Jupiter does not revolve about the sun. Actually, Jupiter and the sun revolve about each other. They actually have a common center of gravity. So as they go around, the sun will actually change its position relative to the Earth. It'll actually get closer and further away from the Earth as Jupiter goes around the sun and pulls at it. Now, I'll grant you that the amount of miles that Jupiter's pull has on the sun is maybe about a million miles. But that's still enough to change some of the temperatures, some of the climate conditions on the Earth. And these scientists actually worked it out. They actually took the, uh, how the sun affected Jupiter's position over a period of 12 years, and they found that the amount of sunlight the Earth gets does vary according to the position of Jupiter. And they also added Venus onto this as well, since Venus is a relatively close planet. And, you know, the, the, uh, the amount of work that was done on this was absolutely, absolutely mind-boggling. 
So Jupiter takes a little less than 12 years to revolve about the sun. So our distance to Jupiter will vary year to year until we end up at the same distance apart a little less than 12 years later. As a result of that movement, because Jupiter does affect the motion of the sun, the sun's effect on the earth will be there. Uh, the sun's uh, uh, solar energy will vary over that 12 years. So when the article appeared in USA Today that was published by Doyle Rice, weird but true orbits of Jupiter and Venus affect Earth's climate. And looking more, every 405,000 years, gravitational effect of, uh, pulls from both Jupiter and Venus will cause Earth's orbit to wobble. And this gradually changes the intensity of our seasonal weather, producing hotter summers and colder winters. And the climate cycles are directly related to how Earth orbits the sun and the slight variations in sunlight reaching the Earth that are caused by the motion of Venus and Jupiter. So they've made up a graph to this at this point, but actually another graph that they had made up, um, actually which I think shows a lot more, the red shows the effect of the Venus, Earth, Jupiter uh, relationship, and the black happens to be sunspots. Now, there is not a one-to-one -one relationship. However, there does, there does seem to be some relationship as far as where the sunspots and where the conjunctions happen to be. They do coincide with each other. So that's another thing that's affecting our weather. That and was hog flatulence. Well, whatever. Anyway, um, so getting back to our solar system, has our solar system always been like this? Has it always been my very educated mother just served us nine pizza pies? Maybe it was, you know, just Mars, Earth. I mean, it could have been something different. And the fact of the matter is that there have been studies about this that show that at least with Uranus and Neptune, those planets, based upon what they're made out of, seems to have stayed on one side of the frost line. Meanwhile, Jupiter, again, because of the fact that it does have organic material on it, seems to have dipped within the frost line at some point. So scientists taking a look at that have wondered have the planets actually migrated with each other? Is there some way we can tell what the, quote, average solar system looked like? And with the uh, Kepler planet finder probes, they've actually come up with a, well, kind of a average solar system. And what they came up with is the fact that most solar systems will have super Earths you know, super rocky Earths close to the star, they don't usually have super giant gas planets. And it's kind of hard to find an Earth-sized planet that's close to the star. So there's some, you know, the average solar system 
doesn't have a smaller Earth-size Earth. They seem to have Earth's, Earth-like uh, planets that are within the habitable zone that are much bigger than the Earth. So they came up with a theory about this that kind of sounds kind of weird. And that is the fact that super Earths form on wide, orbit, on wide orbits and then they migrate inward to the protoplanetary disk and end up close to their stars. So super Earths and sub Neptunes are close to the star while rocky but icy planets are further away. Then you add Jupiter. And then Jupiter actually protects the rocky planets from migrating super Earths. And the migrating of icy bodies are actually blocked by Jupiter so that. 100 million years later, when everything is forming, we have my very educated mother just served us nine pizza pies. So, and as a result of that, we have a gaseous planet like Jupiter with a dense, possibly metallic core surrounded by a metallic ionic hydrogen and then hydrogen gases. Uh, they also have methane. Again, some organic molecules in there. And where did they come? And where did the water come from? So all these things happened because Jupiter, at one time, while the planets were forming, was close to the sun or closer to the sun. So it looks something like this. So it was born to be big. And there's the frost line. Jupiter and Saturn first moved inwards and then outwards to rejoin Uranus and Neptune. And then all four gas plants grew to gigantic proportions by absorbing the hydrogen and uh, helium that was further out. Meanwhile, Uranus and Neptune probably changed places. And then the rest of the planets, the rocky planets formed. Again, well within inside the frost line. So you have a, a planet migration and scattering where the giant planets moved inward, kind of absorbed a lot of the metallic and metal and rocky material, and then moved outward. A summary to all this looks like this. It looks like a real unbelievable game of planetary hopscotch. They call this the grand tack. Again, the migration of the four giant planets uh, going over a period of about 600,000 years. Of course, Velikovsky said, aha, I was right. Not quite, not quite, because according to Velikovsky, this happened within the consciousness of man, and he wrote about it according to myths and legends. So, yeah, the planets migrated, but it certainly wasn't the way that Velikovsky envisioned. But one thing you do have to remember is the fact that Jupiter did protect us from the onslaught of larger asteroids. And that was shown, shown to us amazingly well by taking a look how our solar system is put together. Because between Mars and Jupiter, there is this field of rocks, and they are constantly being churned up by the gravitational effect of Jupiter and a little bit by Mars, but mainly by Jupiter. And as a reason, this came really was pushed to home with the 
uh, with the uh, comet known as Shoemaker Levy, which crashed into Mars, into Jupiter in May of 1994. This was a comet that was torn apart by the gravitational pull of Jupiter and then on its next orbit actually was pulled into Jupiter. So it was definitely possible that Earth could be destroyed or certainly being modified by a, an asteroid of sufficient size. We saw this in 2013 with the Russian uh, asteroid that happened to uh, explode over the Ukraine and uh, burst out windows, knocked down walls and doors. And certainly 70 million years ago, uh, it may have been Jupiter that helped that asteroid hit us. That asteroid that destroyed the dinosaurs and made way, made the path open for mammals to dominate the earth. So our dinosaur is saying, darn Jupiter, what a jerk, because it forced this asteroid to hit us. Meanwhile, the little mammal down there, and further, anyway, so we have to thank Jupiter and in a way curse it because it could be the end, it could possibly be the end of us all. Meanwhile, next week, what we have is We'll learn about Mars, the only plant actually, it, the only plant that we actually uh, sent investigators to to actually look for something. Okay, uh, at this point, uh, if any of you.